When a person is being less than honest, he may not maintain direct eye contact. It's true. The police in this country can flat out lie to you to make you think you have no choice but to confess. This is the number one reaction video that you've been asking for in my comments and in my messages on social media. So two weeks ago, John Oliver did a feature piece all about police interrogation, body language, lie detection techniques, and he said a lot of really important things that everyone should be aware of and a couple of things that need correction. So in this video, a very special guest and myself are gonna break down those scenes and tell you exactly what is accurate and what might need a little bit of amending. My guest this week studied neuroscience at Harvard, and that's on top of his master's in behavioral psychology. He spent 20 years in the military studying and researching body language, lie detection, and interrogation. He went on to become the global best-selling author in those subjects and has created the first and only method of lie detection that is quantitative, which he now teaches to law enforcement, intelligence agencies, and Fortune 500 companies all over the world. I am privileged to call him a teacher, and I am honored to call him a friend. Ladies and gentlemen, Chase Hughes. What's going on, man? How are you? Oof, good to see you. Super excited for this video. I, I have some paddles for us. These are uh, agreement and disagreement paddles. So every time we see a clip, if you agree, you show the camera, I'm like, Great. you get it. Yeah, got it. You studied neuroscience, I think this is pretty. We covered this in our first semester. Of neuroscience, yeah. 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 Uh, here we go, uh, let's just jump right into this thing. All right. Confessions are viewed as the gold standard when it comes to an indicator of guilt, as they can apparently be more persuasive than even DNA evidence. We just felt that no one would confess three times if they didn't do it. Three, two, one. Agreed. And I think this is a great way to start the video. And yeah. I think you're a great way to start. Why? That's a great way to start this video. So I think confessions are not everything. The false confessions are easy to happen, but it does not have to do with the methodology used. It's typically the behavior or the tactics that are outside of that interrogation program uh, that are put into place. So false confessions are common. They are easy to do, and I guess I think we'll talk about that a little bit later, on, on how that can actually happen. And DNA evidence, I would, I would argue, is a little more justifiable than any confession. So I think that's basically the reason this happens, is because when you show a jury that there's evidence and there's a confession, and they don't agree, people look yeah. at evidence and go, oh, I could see how you could plant evidence. I saw that on that one episode of CSI, you know, you plant yeah. a little bit of evidence but they put themselves in the shoes of the person confessing and go, I would never confess to this if I didn't do this. But there are ways that an untrained or a malicious interrogator who just wants to close the case can get a confession from an innocent person. And we've talked about on the channel, there's a whole video which you've seen all about how it's fabricated and how to avoid manipulation. I've got a video for those, I'll leave some links in the description, but that first part is absolutely true and a very dangerous statistic that that does happen. Yeah, certainly is. Of all the convictions that have been overturned through DNA testing, 29% involved false confessions. And you may find that hard to believe, because it can be very hard to comprehend how someone could confess to something they didn't do. Disagree? Disagree. What part do you disagree with? He's saying it's, it's hard to believe that someone could confess to something that they didn't do. Oh, I, oh, I, I mean, like, to the general public, it's hard to believe that. Yeah, so I would agree. No, I took that to mean like, like what I said earlier, like your everyday person, it's hard to accept that you would ever confess to something you didn't do. Yeah. But once you see the science of it, crystal clear that it happens quite a bit. And there are ways, and you teach this in your program, and we're going to talk a lot about what you teach. Step by step, here's what you never do, because these things are a risk of mm -hmm. creating a false confession. Yeah. Can you give us like, maybe, I don't want to give away the whole thing, but like what's one thing you think plays into false confessions? Like what's I'll give one, you three. I'll oh, give you three quick, great, quick yeah. ones. The first one is suggestibility. And suggestibility is fluid and our glucose deficit can change our suggestibility. Our, whether or not we've had sleep can change our suggestibility. So sleep and food. Sleep, food, and authority. Do I view the interrogator as an authority? Whether it's a just authority or a perceived authority does not matter. Do I view them as an authority figure? And all those things affect our suggestibility? Yeah. Okay, that's one, suggestibility. Yeah, so number two is an inherent trust in others. So a person that's automatically trusting of other people, especially, which would automatically feed into an authority figure. That's so sad to me, that like, 
the person who's going to be the most affected by this is someone who's trusting of others. Yeah. The, you, the nicest, yeah. nicest people. And the third is a proneness to fantasy. So they call this fantasy proneness in the research. The person's likelihood that they're prone to creating vivid fantasies and imaginations in their head, which makes them more likely to edit or to have the capacity to edit their own memory. That's insane. So if you're suggestible, if you're kind and you have a vivid imagination, boom. Yeah. Guys, if that matches your description, be careful, lawyer up. Always lawyer. Up. Always lawyer up. All right, now we're going to jump into some really concerning and accurate facts about interrogation. But before we do, do me a huge favor, guys, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavior analysis. One study of false confessions found that they came after an average of 16.3 hours of questioning, which can be utterly exhausting. Innocent people can wind up confessing just to escape the stress of that situation. Yeah. I think it goes back to what you said, 16.3 hours, you're probably not getting proper nutrition, you're tired, suggestibility goes up. At this point, if you've been, let's, let's be honest, if you've been there for 16.3 hours, and you haven't stood up and said, I'm getting out of here because you have the right to do that, you're probably the type of person who's trusting the authority figure because you're letting them keep you there. So that's pretty much everything you just said there without, and by the way, he hadn't seen that clip. So you said that before the clip came up and it plays right into what you said. One thing to add here is when I teach interrogation and when many people, not just me, teach interrogation, our number one priority as an interrogator is to keep that person in short-term thinking mode. Right, and the reason you want short-term thinking is because you don't want them to think of the consequences. You don't want them to go, if I confess this, I'm gonna to go to jail, everyone's gonna, everyone's gonna look down on me, my family's gonna disown me. You wanna keep it about now. What's important now is the truth. Yeah. And so the reason to keep short-term thinking in interrogation is noble, but sometimes when it's been 16 hours, the person's going, now that they're in short-term thinking, they're going, I just need to get out of this room. I need some sleep. I need to eat something. You know what? I did it. Right. If we told everyone the stakes and we were openly honest with everybody and we say, I'm, going, I'm trying to get you to confess to a crime and potentially put you in jail, uh, we would solve way less. Yeah. There would be way less crime solved. I realize there's some, some damage behind some of this. Some of that's untrained or undertrained. Uh, investigators uh, conducting investigations and when I go out to train police departments I'm a little bit horrified that a lot of those officers they've taken maybe a 30-minute class online and a lot of what they do in the interrogation room is what they've seen on TV I'm not <sighs> kidding so let's yeah let's take a look at the next one yeah on that depressing note let's keep going here this retraining film, for instance, explains how barrier postures like crossing your arms are a sign that you're lying. Why do you think Bob said he saw you selling marijuana? Hey, come on, how should I know? I mean, who, who knows why people say things? I sure don't. <sighs> That's bad. I don't even know where to start. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. So he starts by saying that the training states that crossing your arms is a sign of deception. Whether he did his own research, which I doubt, or his research team misunderstood what this means. Sign of deception does not mean that when we see someone crossing their arms, it means they're lying. Right. It means that it's an indicator because there's studies that have been done. And one of my favorite uh, researchers on this actually is a great author by the name of Alan Pease with his wife, Barbara Pease, who did a lot of research on crossed yeah. arms. And he never said, if you look at his stuff, he has never equated crossed arms to deception. Right. He has said we're less receptive when we cross our arms because it's a barrier. More closed off. More closed off. Yeah. And the research does indicate that we retain less when our arms are crossed and we connect less to someone who's speaking with crossed arms. Now, what he, they mean in this is that the way we see deception in an interrogation and even at that, I'm, I'm going to be very specific with my words here. When I say see deception, I mean likelihood of deception is clusters that deviate from baseline. Let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. So I'm not looking for one behavior. No. I'm also not looking for deception. Let's be crystal clear. There is zero nonverbal communication for deception. Zero. To clarify what that means. There are things humans do when they're happy. There are things humans do when they're disgusted, when they're angry, sadness that you will see in every human being across the planet. There is not a single thing that every human does when he or she is lying. Correct. So what we are looking for are signs of stress, disagreement, 
and all of these little things. But I want to see them like they're just a lot of like lotting along here during the conversation. And then I ask a question and now I see six or seven of them at a spike. Now I'm not going to say, oh, that's deception. I'm going to say I need to ask more questions. This is an aberration. This is a change from this person's normal behavior. And more than anything, we're looking for changes in this person's normal behavior more than we're looking for body language in general. And if we look at that actress in that clip, and let's be honest, that's an actress. I've spent years studying behavior. My acute sense of lie detection is telling me that that was not a real interrogation. But the reason I think that the lesson here was misunderstood is because crossed arms is not all we're seeing. We're seeing quite a cluster of deception there, even if it's acted. There's yeah. a postural retreat. Non-answer. Non-answer. Refusal to deny. Yep. Answers the question with another question. How no, why does anybody do what they do? These are all things we study. What I think happened is they really misunderstood that crossed arms is an indicator of deception and took it to mean that alone that means deception. Two very different statements. There's no indicator of deception, only stress. It's not based on any science whatsoever, just based on their own observations. When they've done experiments with it, they pretty much show that the accuracy is like flipping a coin. The real science is, it's baloney. It doesn't work. People move their bodies in all sorts of ways, whether they are telling the truth or not. Do you have a bigger one? Yeah, I need we I want yeah. a bigger one. Come on. There we go. Let's talk about the science and fact thing. Here's the huge issue with all this. You can't take a human interaction into a laboratory. It's like, where's the data for how to win a game of tennis? Or where's the data for uh, techniques to win uh, a certain sport or boxing? Uh, the data isn't there because these, all of these studies, they ignore the temperature in the room, the stakes. What does this person have to lose? The behavior of the operator, the behavior of the subject. The, the human element. Confidence levels, skill levels, yeah. skill levels. The, every time that they do one of these studies, the level of skill and experience uh, is not measured here. So they're, they're training someone for an, uh, half an hour or an hour on a PowerPoint and then saying, okay, you're an interrogator now. You go detect these lies or whatever. So when he says, like, this, the fact is or the science is that it's baloney, the science that it's baloney is from doing it or trying to replicate a real world interrogation inside of a laboratory. I checked the description. They didn't quote the study he's talking about so that we can v validate it. But the one that most people quote was done in a college where there, it wasn't real deception. It was a mock crime. And they said, you did the crime, you did the crime, you didn't do the crime. Now go and get interrogated. So there right. isn't real deception. Yeah. They're, de they're, they're lying about lying. And by the way, if we're going to talk about the science of it, you can name studies that didn't work, but there are also enormous amounts of studies that did work. For example, I will leave it in the description. You guys can read up about this. James E. Driscoll conducted a lot of research on this, and he pointed out that different trainings, especially when they're done for a while, do bold much better results, yeah. up to 25% better at detecting lies than your average person. So. Quoting one study without giving your source, to me, it's not that convincing. One more thing before we pop into this next clip is that there is definitely, and you really can't contest this in any way, tons of studies done on isolated behaviors that appear more often in liars. There is 100% undeniable research done that says, for example, off the top of my head, liars move less than truth tellers. There's at least a dozen studies done on that alone and tons of stuff, and one man has compiled all those behaviors into a very comprehensive table of elements, of, of, of different elements that indicate deception, has quantified it, and it is a brilliant tool. It's available for free online, and that man is sitting to my right. And that is such a beautiful thing you did with that, and Thank law you, enforcement man. is taught this, intelligence agencies are taught this, and when someone really grasps that and applies it, we see the result. Because these are scientifically proven things that happen in liars. And again, you've never stated that if you see a cluster of these behaviors, that means deception. It's quite simply, there's a likelihood of deception here. Likely. Higher likelihood. 
So as I was editing this video, I realized something. This video is not only good as a response to the footage we're looking at, but in general towards skeptics when it comes to body language. Because I see in the comments you guys all the time are like sort of trying to educate people who come in here really not knowing too much about body language, thinking they know everything because they read an article once. And all these studies that I will leave in the description, all the things we're talking about in this video is a great response to educate people who don't really understand the science behind body language. It advises that when a person is being less than honest, he may not maintain direct eye contact, but also others may overcompensate by staring. <laughs> Meaning, if you have eyes, you're basically f***ed. <sighs> oh, oh, my God. Okay, I, I, oof, I just need to say this. I need to just get this off my chest. If, if he watched a uh, video by a botanist who said, if you give your plant too much water, you're going to kill it. If you don't give your plant enough water, you're going to kill it. Is the botanist saying that you are inadvertently going to kill your plant with water? Yeah. I think it's easy to understand that, first of all, we, we talked about this earlier, but let's talk about it some more. Baseline. People have a certain baseline behavior that they, they maintain a certain amount of eye contact. When they deviate from that baseline in deception, yes, there are studies that show that some people avert eye contact, but Samantha Mann, did research in an airport and they analyzed footage of people who were trying to smuggle things into a country. Yeah. And she saw that, yes, some liars increase eye contact. But if I saw someone increasing eye contact, going back to what we said again and again, if I just saw someone increasing eye contact after I asked them a question, it would be meaningless unless it was accompanied by a number of other things. Correct. Okay, rant over, Chase, go. This is interesting and that's the same thing i was thinking in my head if i drive over the speed limit it's against the law if i drive way under the speed limit it's against the law so if i own a car i'm screwed i'm breaking the law uh, what i think is brilliant here is the way that they weave the argument to convince some people that that it makes sense so to some people that makes sense it's comedy it's made to be funny i get it uh, but this whole thing, body language and, and behavior profiling is a lot like being a metal detector at an airport. So you go through a TSA checkpoint, the, and you're, let's say you're the TSA officer, or you're the security person at the airport. The metal detector goes off, you don't know, does this guy have a giant belt buckle that needs to come off, or does he have an AK-47 down his pants? We don't know. So what we're, the metal detector is this little cluster, this little spike in behavior or a deviation from this person's normal behavior means that another search needs to happen. I need to ask more questions. I need to get more data. The metal detector does not tell you that there's deception or intent or anything like that. It tells you a place you need to focus on. Beautiful, beautiful uh, analogy. Thank you. I'd like to offer one as well. Uh, meteorology, I think, is a great comparison because all the time you have you know, it, it's based in science. Science has shown us what to look yeah. for to know what the weather is going to do, but it doesn't give you the ability to predict it with 100% accuracy. And despite the fact that we all know that it's not a perfect science, we still check the weather network to know if we should push our barbecue to the next day. Every day. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's based in science, but all it gives us is, okay, maybe this is gonna happen. We need to look into that. Likelihood. Likely. We're looking at likelihood. Comes back to likelihood, guys. Likelihood. We're going to change the name of the channel to the Likelihood Arts. No, no, no! What do you want to hear? Like, tell me what you want me to say and I'll say it! Tell me what you want me to say and I'll say it! And the thing is, people might assume that even if they falsely confess, they can later recant and the real evidence will prevail and clear them. <sighs> okay, well, we don't need to paddle. What he said there at the end was correct. But I just did the, the reason I put this clip in here is because I had a very serious question for you. How much of your studies in your master's in behavioral psychology, and then all your studies in neuroscience at Harvard, 20 years in the military, how much of that, I'm assuming it was a pretty good percentage, how much of it was based on My Little Pony? Well, My Little Pony is kind of the, the base of the pyramid for all behavior and psychology training. Uh, a lot of people think it's Sigmund Freud or Carl Jung. My Little Pony is... <laughs> but I think that's gonna be persuasive to some people. If it's funny, they can identify with it. If they can identify with it, they can believe it. I get it. I get it. Look, as an entertainer, I, I even like John Oliver as an entertainer. Yeah. He makes me laugh the way he says things. It's so funny. I've watched videos of his before. I'm not attacking the person. I'm just saying there's a couple of things here 
that are, you know, not exactly right. A lot of actually accurate things he said there in the beginning. We're going to see some yeah. more. There's just a couple of things there in the middle. It's all lighthearted, guys. We think, he, you know, he's a comedian, ultimately. This is comedy. Yeah, and he does it really well. Yeah. Legally. In the United States, a detective can legally lie about the evidence to a suspect. It's true. The police in this country can flat out lie to you to make you think you have no choice but to confess. It is lawful for detectives to turn to a suspect and say, you say you didn't do this, but we've got your fingerprints on the murder weapon. You don't talk to me, I can't keep you from the worst. Well, is it there? <laughs> Damn it, Robert, you were. You were there, the evidence shows you were there. The evidence shows you, I can't lie about the evidence. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Uh, it's, I, I'm, I'm glad we came back to, to real things, and this is important to talk about. Again, there's examples on the channel of a case that I, you know, I shared with you with um, Wes Myers, that guy, who, kind guy whose girlfriend had died, and they, they were just badgering and badgering. Yeah. And it's like that. That's a great clip, actually. I do think, you know, it's ironic. We were walking My Little Pony. That's a great example of that. The way he's aggressively, we see this man crying, yeah. and the interrogator is like, you were there. The evidence points to that. It's awful. I'm, I'm in no business of lawmaking or kind of litigating some of this stuff. But I'd say uh, directly lying about physical evidence is something that might not be a good idea, especially yeah, to people how, you know, people have different suggestibilities. And you're not going to screen every human being walking to the police station. Oh, there are 37 on this scale, so we can't lie to them. That's never going to happen. And it's a really slippery slope in this case. Because, you know, to, who's going to measure what lie is okay and what lie isn't okay and to what end your means justify your ends? Because it's clear to see that at some point it's just ridiculous. And also we have to account for suggestibility. Because, you know, I talk about this in my gaslighting video. If I just say to the viewers right now, take a deep breath of air in and imagine under your feet a little tingle going back and forth. Imagine, it's just tingle. Maybe it's on the left foot, maybe it's on the right foot, but you're feeling this tingle under your feet. Do you feel a tingle? Yeah. Just because you think about it. Yeah. Your, your, your mind can create things just because you think about it. So if a, a detective is looking at you, and like you said, you're an empathetic, kind person, and you're sleep deprived, and he's going, your fingerprints were there. Your fingers, were, you're, you're going, were they there? And it creates a reality. I think at a minimum, if, if the lying continues, or if it's continuing to be allowed, because I don't know what the right answer is, but I think that the fact that I am legally allowed to lie to you should be part of your Miranda rights. It should be, you have the right to remain silent, blah, 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 anything you say can and will be used against you, and I am legally allowed to represent false evidence against I you. I love that. Because I bet that if we were to ask most people, is an interrogator allowed to lie to you? I don't think most would know that they are. I think most would say that, no, I'm sure the law protects me. That's what I would have thought if I hadn't studied this. I would have said, no, come on, that doesn't make any sense. So I think there's a lot of people out there who don't know that. He lied as he lied about the evidence and did it gesturing with all the theatrical nuance of a high schooler auditioning for a few good men. Hold on. Let's just pause for a second. Did he just use body language to say that the man in the video was being insincere? He did. Because people move their bodies in all sorts of ways, whether they are telling the truth or not. So yeah, we'll give this one. Yeah, I'll give big, this one a big, green big green thumbs. Couple of green thumbs. Yeah. Absolutely, we completely agree. That man was being very insincere in the way that he was saying it. John Oliver used the man's behavior to determine that he was being insincere in the way that he did it. So John Oliver, we're so glad that we all agree that there are ways to observe behavior and body language in order to know if somebody's being sincere or insincere. Big thumbs. Agreed. And it is more than a little infuriating how that investigator convinces him of doubting his own memory by making it seem like it happens all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. Two thumbs up. And three uh, <laughs> thumbs up. I have spent a lot of my career, 30,000 plus hours, researching a lot of this stuff for the government. And a huge piece of that, or a significant piece of that, was the false memory stuff. Yep. Uh, when you get a person to start questioning their own memory, you're down not even a slippery slope. There's no traction, period, on that slope. It's ice. If I have another interrogator and we're interrogating you, and I say, Spidey, what did you eat? It, today is Wednesday. So what did you eat Sunday for lunch? 
I can't remember. And I turned to my other interior, John, what, what did you eat for lunch? He goes, a oh, cheese sandwich. And that's how we start. I'm, ju- I'm not even going to say there's something wrong with your memory. I'm going to make you start doubting that from the beginning. That's crazy. And if it continue, I'm going to continue to do that. I just want to make sure they understand what just happened there. So it's like, I, because I can't remember, which is normal, it's but you, normal. your partner is scripted to make it feel like it's yeah. abnormal to not remember. Yes. I'm doubting my own memory capacity. From the, from the get go without me telling you to do it. Right. But that's the very, that's the tiny slice at the very beginning. If you're, if, if an interrogator is doing this, they need to be in jail for doing this, or they need to take the person of, of the person they got to, take the place of the person they got to falsely confess. But that's just the slice at the beginning to make someone start to doubt their own memory. And you can do this very quickly. And I'm talking in the, in the, in the time span of 25 minutes, you can get somebody to a point of false confession using techniques like this. Please, please, I'm gonna leave some links in the mm-hmm. description. You're gonna find all the studies we talked about, all the links to Chase's books. They are the best books I've read on lie detection, human behavior, and Thanks. profiling. Excellent stuff. I'm going to leave a link to the video that I made about ways to avoid gaslighting and manipulation, the tools that gaslighters use and how you can counter those tools and stay in the critical and in the sort of logical rather than the emotional and the chaos. Very important stuff, all in the description. Love it. Only 30 states require the recording of interrogations at all, and in the rest, it's up to the police. I don't know. Yeah? I didn't know that. Uh, I mean, I give a green thumbs up for accuracy. And the second thumbs up is, I think recording should be mandatory. That if I'm, if I'm going to a person's house and collecting crime, seeing data and I'm collecting evidence that goes into a bag that gets signed it gets photographed a a chain of custody is instantaneously established and this this piece of evidence is what's going to put someone away my interrogation should also be have the exact same chain of custody such a great point because if because if a lawyer can prove that the way evidence was obtained was faulty it gets thrown out absolutely it's not even shown to the jury yeah if i find a bullet casing in your house i can use that as evidence if i get a confession i can use that as evidence the way that i obtained that bullet casing is documented photograph video and everything the way that i obtained that confession nothing there's nothing so i I do think that it, it should be filmed in my interrogation courses. I have probably, I spend at least two hours telling people what not to do yep. and how to avoid a false confession. And here's the recipe that makes a false confession happen so that anyone trained by me that produces a false confession will never be able to say they didn't know what they were doing or they didn't know how to do it. And you say that. You, it, it's not that you're saying that now. You say that in the training. I've taken the training own, yeah. and you say, the reason I'm showing you this is so that if you ever go apply this, because a lot of your students are law enforcement, intelligence agencies, if you, when you go apply this stuff, if you get a false confession and you say, oh, I didn't know, you come back to this, I, there's evidence that I'm teaching you this right now. Yeah, it's sad because there's people in jail that shouldn't be. I agree with John Oliver on a lot of this stuff. Yeah. He's got a comedy show to make. Yeah, no, most of uh, this is so important to get out there. I think yeah. we both agree on that, that this message is very important. A couple of things in the middle that it's not even wrong. It's just misinformation. We yeah. ultimately agree. Crossed arms do not indicate deception in any way. Yeah. I mean, they do as part of a cluster and a deviation from baseline. It's complicated. I think we covered it. All right, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that. I know this was a bit more conversational, but there was a ton of great information in there from a man that I respect enormously for some of the best research and information on this topic. Can't thank you enough for joining us, Chase. Let me know in the comments how you enjoyed this and what you would like to see from Chase Hughes because I'm basically going to make him make more videos for you guys. He's stuck with me. So let me know. What do you want to, what do you want to know? What do you want to learn? Let us know in the comments. See you guys next time. Thanks, Chase.